Well, good morning, everybody. We're uh, taping this October 15th, a beautiful fall day in New England, even though it's drizzling outside, but we're driving through tunnels of gold and green and red and orange. And uh, the Red Sox won last night. They're even the series at two and two, one and one. And of course, uh, the Patriots won on the last second field goal last night. So everything is good in, uh, in New England today. Uh, shout out to um, uh, all of you that uh, uh, have been participating in all of the uh, activities of the Council on Aging. We're here today with our peerless outreach and program coordinator, Angela Smith, David Klein, our COA director. We're here uh, with two guests this morning, one of whom uh, you've already heard from uh, via the mail is uh, Jennifer Ubaldino, who is the executive director of the Concord Carlisle Community Chest, and Dr. Megan Ford, who is a doctor of audiology, who will be speaking about program uh, 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 topics associated with hearing. So um, a shout out to Ellen Huber, who's recovering from back surgery at Emerson uh, Rehab. Hi, Ellen. Hope you're going to get better quick. And uh, I guess I could start. Uh, Angela, would you like to start, or how, who, would, who would like to jump in here? David? Uh, I'll um, just, uh, just announce that um, hopefully this goes out before the end of the month and people will see it. We're going to uh, be running our, um, for our fourth intergenerational um, Concord um, excuse me, Concord Carlisle, Carlisle um, Road Race, which is actually Road Races, on um, November 12th, which is uh, the day after Veterans Day, but it's the Monday, so hopefully um, the kids will be able to participate because school will be closed. And uh, actually, it, it's, a, um, it's an event which, for the first couple of years, um, we got some seed money from the community chest, mm -hmm. which was great, and... Um, um, we were able to bank a little bit of that. Uh, we broke even one year. We, we, almost, we just barely um, lost money one year. And then last year, we, we actually lost a good amount of money. So this year, we'll probably use up the rest of the money we got from the community <laughs> chest. And we'll see where things go. I, I mean, we actually considered whether it was going to be worth it to have it this year from a, a fiscal point of view. But it is the 100th anniversary of um, the 1918 armistice that, mm. that ended World War I. Mm. So, and we've got other projects going on here in Carlisle, the Poppy Project that, um, who's running? Deborah Bentley. Deborah Bentley, how quickly I forget. She just did a wonderful presentation um, on Scotland, Deborah did the other day. And um, so that's exciting. Anyway, we're hoping to get um, good participation. I mean, that's really what we found is that if we can get about 200 people, that we can make this a viable event. But last year, we had this perfect storm of really tough weather on, that, on the Saturday that it was run. And the fact that it was run on a Saturday made it difficult because apparently a lot of kids have, and I guess if you're a parent, you know this, have a lot of events going on on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so, whereas on a Monday, um, you know, I think that we'll, we'll, we'll be doing a little bit better. So anyway, I'm taking up too much time, but I want to encourage everybody to, um, that's interested that you have a, a, a child or whether you're just a runner and you, uh, and you want to participate in a really great um, event, it, you can register at www.lightboxreg.com, and um, it'll be in the back page of our newsletter, or you can look for the press release or ads that will be up and coming over the next couple of weeks in the Mosquito. So that's a 1K and a 5K, right? It is a one mile and a 5K, and yes. A 5K. And the one mile tends to be dominated by the younger generations. Uh, I think uh, like our top, top time a year or two ago was uh, the top three runners were, were, were girls like aged 14 and below, or 12 <laughs> and below even. It was really, uh, really yes. something, yeah. Um, and... Um, and then we have discounted pricing also for kids under 19, people over 60, and any veterans that enter the race. Good. Very good. Hope it's successful again this year. I think it probably will be. It, it's, it's, it's a nice event. Um, it's just, you know, a little bit later in the year, and the weather is just really unpredictable <laughs> once you start yes. getting in November. Mm -hmm. Good. So I just received this in the mail. It's, a, it's a, an envelope, 
and I can put in as much or little as I wish to donate to the Concord Carlisle Community Chest. And I'm sure you've gotten one too, so look for it if you haven't seen it already. And uh, Jennifer, you've been at this for how long with the Community Chest? I am chest? just coming upon my one year anniversary at the there Chest. There you go, yes. all right. And um, um, pumping new energy into uh, the whole process. How many um, different organizations do you support now? Last year, we supported 29 different nonprofit organizations. Yeah. So a whole array of organizations serving elders, children, families, all in the human services field. Yep. Huh. So yeah, so we, um, we, as many people and viewers know, I'm sure, Community Chest has been a longstanding community organization for more than 70 years. So we've been going at this for a while. Uh, I think we change things up a little bit every year, but um, we are, only as strong as everyone here in our communities participates. And we are actually here to pool resources from individuals, um, local businesses, and foundations, and put those monies into nonprofit organizations and to serve the direct needs of residents in our towns. That's really what we're here to do. We've been doing the same thing since 1947. We've changed it up a little bit, maybe a little more technologically savvy now, but that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Um, I would say the biggest impact we have, and some of you may know about this, is that we have a, um, an allocations committee that has 34 um, different varying community members to serve on it as volunteers each year, and they review applications from a host of nonprofits, and the Council on Aging being one of them who applies to us and we've supported for many years now. Um, and we have the difficult decision of we review applications, we make site visits to meet with, meet with the leadership, and I'm gonna have to decide where those monies get spent each year. Um, and unfortunately, there's, there's uh, last year we had a 25% increase in requests for funds. And while we want to be every need, we, we can't unless we, we get the monies in to us. So you know, th I will say that's one thing that um, not everybody in our communities realizes that there is a need here. There are families and children that struggle. We may not see it. But, you know, um, just a few little points that the community services coordinator is a wonderful woman who serves residents in both communities. And in the last two years, the number of clients she's served asking for financial assistance in many ways has more than doubled. Um, we have families that we hear from who struggle with preschool costs. It's very expensive to pay for a high quality preschool. And as the boomer population in ages, and uh, you can probably speak this better than I can, mm -hmm. um, the, and that is a growing area with the elders, that um, the needs and resources that are, that are on, on you and, and your colleagues continues to grow. Mm -hmm. And those are just a few of the needs that we have heard about, but they're growing, there's many, and that's why we're here to try and raise funds to then support the pr programs that you do. Well, I, I know your, your contributors if they're anything like like me, they, they say, what did I what did I pay last year? And they write this check for the same amount this year, right? And that can go on for four or five or six <laughs> years. And wouldn't it be nice if everyone said, uh, just add another ten percent this year, just another ten percent. If you have twenty five percent more more uh, requests, it uh, it will help at least fill some of that gap. So uh, I think we need to be reminded that a static amount is great. We love to have it. <laughs> But uh, the needs keep growing. Absolutely. I like your thinking, Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. The growth is important. I mean, and, and we, we want to be able to, to help everywhere that we can um, and do so thoughtfully, too. Um, so October is Community Chess Month, which is why I'm thrilled to be here today for a few minutes and share that. Um, it's the launch of our annual campaign, getting those envelopes in the mail, hopefully seeing us around town at different events and, and throughout the community. Um, and, and it is the time when we raise all of the funds that we give away um, next June. So the, those dollars that are put in the mail go really directly to, to the organizations that need them. So I'm hoping that you know, everyone watching this segment will um, think about that and, um, and find a way to contribute. Great. And I will say, other than there's a couple ways to do that. There is obviously mailing a check-in, but we also can go on our website, which is um, ccommunitychess.org, and you can contribute that way. Call our office, multiple ways to, to give. Great.
Excellent. Thank we, you so much. Yeah. We, we uh, I should just add, we benefit greatly. We, Carlisle, benefits greatly from the community chess and everything they do. And it kind of reverberates around. I'm sure you, sure you hear that because um, we've had other um, organizations that you've supported be here and be guests of our program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and some of them are very impressive organizations. In our case, um, Carrie, as, as you know, we've got several programs that our, our friends group supports and then other programs of community chess support, sometimes a little, little bit of crossover, but it, it's basically um, things that are really necessary, um, like our, our, so, our um, social worker, mm -hmm. who's been really such an integral part of our process over the last 10 years, even before I got here. Um, and um, I'm not sure what we would have done in some cases without Peter. We would have had a very big gap in what we were able to provide in terms of services for, for people with the most need. Right, exactly. I, I could list other things, but I mean, that really, that really says it all. Um, it, it really it really is so, so important so we thank you oh, thank very you much for doing the work that you do <laughs> yeah and jennifer really has updated things uh, on, on the technology side we uh, the last year the application was uh, submitted online for the first time <laughs> which was great and um um so uh, and things are changing rapidly in in our world i mean um we we curry sat in on a in, in a meeting we had two weeks ago with uber and then the next week we had a meeting with Lyft. I and mean, now we're looking at actually providing transportation through Uber and Lyft because one of the things that we're facing on the transportation side, and I think this may be, affect all of the organizations you, fa is, yes. uh, you see, is there's not enough drivers around. Yeah. And so the Uber and Lyft um, drivers um, are starting to comprise a larger and larger pool of, of, of available uh, mm. people. So anyway, we're looking, trying to innovate and I don't know where that's taking us, but it, you can't stay static. You have mm -hmm. to keep on trying new things. So anyway, thank you all for all that you guys do, thank Jennifer. You. There you go. <laughs> um, we also are very fortunate to have Dr. Megan Ford uh, with us this morning. Megan is uh, an audiologist, Correct. doctor in audiology, mm -hmm. which is a new term for me. Uh, even though I, uh, uh, every time Janice says, uh, take out the trash, I say, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's uh, something, audio, hearing and sight are those two things that can go very, very gradually. Mm -hmm. But for most of us, when we reach a certain age, we begin to feel the effects of, a lot of, of slight changes in those things. But it can happen at birth. Mm -hmm. It can happen at any time in terms of hearing. That's right. So uh, you're in a very interesting field, one that probably relatively few people know very much about. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'd like to know more. So sure. uh, tell yeah. us a little bit. Well, um, hearing loss, like you said, is one of those things that can happen gradually. And it's also invisible. Um, where people see it usually is other family members notice it first. What? and. <laughs> I hear that a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a common joke that I get often. But um, but yeah, people will often not notice it's happening to themselves, but um, family members will often be the first to notice and feel the impact of the communication breakdown. Um, I think one of the reasons why I got inspired um, to go into this field, probably subconsciously, I grew up in a family, there's hearing loss that runs out throughout my family. Um, and my dear father, who turned 86 yesterday, happy birthday, dad, um, he um, had hearing loss from a younger age. Um, and I remember being a small child and like climbing on his lap and being fascinated with his hearing aids and pulling them out and putting them back in and <laughs> um, going with him to the audiologist. And um, I remember one time um, his hearing aids broke and he never got them fixed. And then I witnessed the communication breakdown. And I remember my mom and dad talking from two different rooms and not, you know, my dad wasn't hearing what my mom was saying. And I was kind of standing in between the two rooms thinking, well, he can't hear you. <laughs> he doesn't have his hearing aids on. So I think from a young age, I became aware of that. I didn't really um, think, oh, when I was in high school, I'm going to go become an audiologist. Um, but I did witness that. Um, I kind of got into it also being fascinated with American Sign Language. And, um, and I, 
I took that in college as a foreign language. Um, and then I met some people that were profoundly deaf and that's how they communicated, um, which I thought that was fascinating and, um, and it really gave me insight to that what the world is like for people where the world is silent and for people that grew up with hearing loss since they were babies. Um, and then when I ended up going into the field uh, professionally, um, one of the things that audiologists do, which is the most difficult part of our job, is we screen newborns at birth. And one out of every one to two thousand babies, or one to two out of every thousand babies, are born with um, permanent hearing loss. And the most difficult part is um, telling the parents about that because it's usually unexpected. Ninety-eight percent of the time, the parents have normal hearing, and there's it's a complete shock to the parents and the families. Um, so having to, to inform parents that your baby is perfectly healthy except um, has trouble hearing and, and will most likely need either hearing aids or a cochlear implant in order to develop speech and language, if that's the route that they choose to go. Um, and so I ended up um, forming a support group for parents of children with hearing loss back in 2007, and that's called Hear My Dreams, and we now have three chapters in Massachusetts. It's a, a growing support system that's definitely needed, um, and I do that just to volunteer my time back to the profession because I really love what I do. Um, so that's kind of something that I do, not really as a nonprofit, I just volunteer my time, and there's other audiologists now that have volunteered their time to, to facilitate these meetings for parents. So you have your own private practice as well. Yes, yeah. I do now. I um, started off my career 20 years ago working um, at Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary in Boston. That's what brought me to this area because I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. By the way, the Steelers won last night as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I beat Notre Dame. <laughs> Well, oh, the, no, oh, the, the Steelers, Steelers. Oh, yeah, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know about Pitt, <laughs> Pitt and uh, Notre Dame, but so um, I worked in three major hospitals before I decided to open my own private practice in Littleton, where I live. So, yeah. I, we see uh, for, for these uh, problems at birth, you mm -hmm. mentioned cochlear implant. Is yes. this, are there remedies that are sort of magic bullets, or is this a, sl a long slog? Nothing can restore hearing back to a normal range of sensitivity. And hearing is a very interesting sense, because we don't just hear with our ears or our eardrums or the little bones inside the middle ear or even the cochlea. We actually process everything with our brain. So a large part of hearing has to do with our auditory cortex. Um, it has to pass through the filter of our peripheral ear system, which includes the pinna that we can see, the ear canal, the eardrum, the middle ear with the little bones, and the cochlea, which the cochlea itself is fascinating, and I could talk for hours on that, but I won't. Um, but <laughs> if that system is damaged in any way, which often it's the, the little hair cells in the cochlea causing a sensory loss, which is the most common type of hearing loss that people have. Um, if that system is damaged, then it's like a damaged filter. So the sound waves can come in, it goes through this damaged filter causing blurriness of speech. Um, a lot of times people will tell me, I can hear, I just can't understand the words or if they're in a complex environment where there's background noise, forget it. Um, that's because the brain is listening to something that's all jumbled up from the damage in the cochlea. Um, now there's research, scientific studies are showing a, a strong correlation between untreated hearing loss and dementia, memory problems, and Alzheimer's. I just got back from a conference and um, one of the things that we got to listen to uh, wonderful speech um, on the neuroscience of the brain. Um, and as we age, the brain processing does slow down, but in no way is it abolished. And we, we still can, our brains can still change and grow um, structurally, chemically, and the way it functions. We can as, still learn. As we're older, yeah. Even in your, into your 80s and 90s, um, our brains are always changing. And one of the big things that this person was talking about is that exercise has a direct impact on um, the growth and change of the brain in a positive way. So exercising is one thing you can do. But the most, um, the, the most common modifiable risk factor from midlife on to prevent dementia is actually treating hearing loss. 
Um, studies are showing that if you leave hearing loss untreated for, for too long, your risk for memory problems increases dramatically. Whereas if you choose to seek treatment and get access to sound through hearing aids, or if a candidate for, with cochlear implants, um, then you have a decreased risk of memory problems. So that, that's something that I think is really huge um, for the aging population and the baby boomers um, to really think about. Well, I've observed personally the, this vicious cycle of dementia, early dementia, and mm -hmm. hearing loss, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, <coughs> after a while the person just sort of tunes out and then yes. yeah. uh, doesn't become engaged, and it's, right? just, it's awful. Well, hearing loss is isolating. Um, people with hearing loss, with untreated hearing loss, have an increased risk of anxiety and depression. Mm. Um, you start to uh, decline social invitations because you know you're not going to hear in that big crowd anyway, so what's the point? I hear that all the time. Um, one of the things that it inspires me, and I love what I do because I get to see transformations take place a lot. If we are treating the hearing loss, we get to see people become better versions of themselves. And it's amazing. And people will come back and, and give me their testimonies. And it's just so rewarding to me it, it, that I can have a little small part of that just by, by doing what I do. So keeping that part of the brain working. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, this is something, we have so many programs, as you know, uh, here for uh, the senior population. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see that. Yes. And where people, you know, I don't want to be embarrassed because I can't really engage in the conversation, so I won't go to that luncheon. Yes. And, and that, that sort of mm -hmm. you know, slippery slope. Exactly. So uh, the, the other thing, I, I'm always curious, on the Internet I'm getting all these tinnitus uh, yeah. cures on the uh, Internet. Are they, is that legitimate in any way? Should I pay any attention? No. There, well, there really is no known cure for tinnitus. Um, tinnitus, sorry. Tinnitus, tinnitus, both ways are correct. Um, I think audiologists tend to say tinnitus because tinnitus indicates that there's some kind of infection and it's not an infection. But it is, um, it can be caused, we think, from a few different things. But hearing loss and tinnitus definitely go hand in hand. So if you have hearing loss, the brain tends to fill in the space of the sound that's missing with this noise. Um, so it's generated from, we think, in the brain. Um, when people get hearing aids and can then get access to the soft sounds that they're missing in the frequency range where they're missing it normally, if we can give access and they wear the hearing aids during all waking hours, that does tend to sometimes decrease the noticeability of the tinnitus in about, I would say about 80% of the people that we fit with hearing aids. Not everyone, sometimes it's, it's just really bad no matter what. Um, we don't, there's all different kinds of reasons why we think people get that. Sometimes it's medications that, can, that are ototoxic that can cause hearing loss. Sometimes it's loud noise exposure. A lot of musicians and people exposed to loud machines will experience it. But the thing about tinnitus, it's, if you think about it, our brains are, are programmed to pick up sound and signals. And so if you have good sensitivity and you can hear all of the sounds in the environment, um, you don't notice what the brain is, is doing. But when you start to lose your hearing, um, you don't hear the soft sounds in the environment anymore. And then all you hear is what the brain is generating in this tinnitus. So when we give people back hearing aids or access to sound through hearing aids, those soft sounds are now coming through and kind of masking the tinnitus. So it goes kind of in the background. So. Speaking of loud noises, everybody's wearing earplugs and uh my grandson and daughter are listening to loud music all yes. the time. Yeah. Should I be concerned about that? So I always say that the length of time you listen to music is just as important as how loud you listen to it. Um, OSHA has guidelines and standards for people that work around um, really loud equipment. Um, and if you are listening to music at a moderate to loud level for 10 hours a day, which kids can do nowadays because it's so easy. They have their phones with them all the time. They have wireless earbuds. Even now, some of the hearing aids have that direct connectivity to, to devices. But if you're listening to a moderate to loud level for 10 hours, that can be just as damaging as if you listen to an extremely loud um, song for a few minutes. So you want to just kind of give your ear breaks. Those little hair cells are like blades of grass in our cochlea. And if you listen to really loud sounds, it's like trampling down on that grass 
And if you do that too much, then the grass isn't going to grow back. So same with the hair cells. Mm. Interesting. The, um, I, I wanted to ask you about um, hearing aids in general. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so easy for me to be, you know, victim of a scam for any one of a number of things on the Internet. Um, yeah. And is, is there a lot that people should be wary of in terms of uh, people selling them hearing aid devices? Well, um, I think that over-the-counter hearing aids are now FDA approved to be released in a couple of years from now. So in, in the near future, people are going to be able to go to CVS or Walgreens or walk into a private practice like mine and pick a pair of hearing aids off the shelf and just walk away with them. And they're going to be for people with very mild, basic, flat kind of hearing losses. Um, I can tell you that seeing an audiologist is going to give you the service in addition to the product of a hearing aid. Um, a lot of times people complain that hearing aids cost so much, but traditionally in our profession, we've bundled the price of service with the cost of a device, a hearing aid. And people don't realize that um, we we, we should be itemizing and separating that and making it more transparent for people. So when over-the-counter hearing aids come out, I think that what you're going to see is kind of a more breakdown, transparent unbundling of the services that you get when you come to see a professional. And what we do is we help people to understand um, the need for their hearing aid. We, under, we teach people how to physically put it in their ear, which can be very difficult and challenging at first. Um, we teach people how to care for their hearing aids, clean them. Earwax can get into the hearing aids. There's little tiny parts and filters and things that if the person has poor vision or poor dexterity, we can do that sort of thing for them on a regular basis and just make sure that they're getting the benefit that, and verify and validate that the hearing aids are doing what they're supposed to do. We have special technology and equipment that can actually put the prescription into the hearing aid and then verify in the ear if it's actually doing what it's supposed so to do. So a relationship with an audiologist would begin with an assessment? Yeah, typically. Problem. Typically we would start, we would want to have results of what is your hearing. When, when, when I meet somebody, when I walk in the door and I start communicating with them, I'm already envisioning what the results on that graph are going to be. We do a, a test and we graph the results on an audiogram, we call it. And um, that is kind of critical information for the audiologist to know what sounds are out of that person's listening range. What is that person's range of hearing? Mm -hmm. So, And then an ongoing sort of almost like physical therapy, mm -hmm. ear yeah. therapy, right, in terms yeah. of... We call it auditory therapy or in auditory rehab, but yes, I mean, it's all part of, it's a process, definitely. Um, it's not at all like glasses. You don't just get glasses, you don't just get hearing aids and put them on and then instantly your hearing is corrected. It's very, very different than that. Um, it's a process and the brain has to readjust. Um, a lot of times people will say that when they first get the hearing aids, when they speak, the mouth is the closest thing to the microphone of the hearing aids, so their own voice might sound echoey. Mm -hmm. That's a normal phenomenon, because when we're born and we start babbling, we hear ourselves very loud because our mouth is so close to our ears, but we don't think about our own voice at all until you've gone many years with hearing loss and haven't heard it, and then all of a sudden you go to the audiologist and get fitted with hearing aids, and there's your voice again all of a sudden. So there's a lot. It's, it's a process, and it's not just the sound, it's the physically putting it in your ear, which can be challenging for people. Um, caring for it and changing the batteries um, and cleaning it. And, um, and then there's warranties and technology is rapidly changing too. So many people now are using their iPhones to control their hearing aids. Um, and even if you lose your hearing aid, you can now look on an app on your iPhone to find where is your hearing aid. <laughs> is it at the gym? Did I leave my hearing aid on the shelf? Where is it? So, I, You mentioned uh, Hear My Dreams. Mm -hmm. tell, in the next last couple of minutes we have, could you tell us a little bit about that? You're obviously passionate about what you do. Well, I love Hear My Dreams. It's, um, it's a support group for parents of children with hearing loss. Um, it's... It's to give the parents an, a place to learn um, from other parents, make connections with other parents, um, and kind of find their community. Because like I said, when a baby is born with hearing loss, 98% of the time the parents have normal hearing and have no idea. They've never met anyone um, that has, has a child with hearing loss. 
Uh, so here, my dreams is just an, a venue and opportunity to get education <laughs> and to um, learn and how make connections. Meet the parents will meet each other, and then the relationships develop outside of the meetings, which is great because then long term they can get the kids together and they can learn from each other. If they need to fight for services through the public school systems, they can give each other tips and hints on how to do that. So it's great. <laughs> yes, David. Uh, I was curious, you mentioned American Sign Language earlier, Dr. Ford, um, with parents of kids that have, that are diagnosed yes. early on, is American Sign Language one of those things that's just put on the table automatically or is it, or, or do people tend to go for the more technological, not, I don't want to use the word fix, but, but process mm -hmm. and then use American Sign Language as a backup <laughs> or, or are they used in tandem? Well, in Massachusetts, actually, this I've, wor I've worked, um, well, I was studied in Pennsylvania and I worked in Ohio, but in Massachusetts, they're, um, for part of the early intervention program that the state provides includes a um, family home sign language program. So every child, the family um, of every child that is born with hearing loss can receive this education. F I forget how many weeks it is. It's like a set number of weeks that you... Um, somebody comes to the home, often sometimes it's somebody that is actually deaf and uses American Sign Language to communicate. They will teach the entire family sign language for so many weeks. Um, and then that is a free service to all of the families in Massachusetts. And I will tell you that a lot of the families that come to the support group, they will um, learn some signs in, the same, in conjunction with um, giving their child access to hearing, which tends to be the more common um, thing that parents choose to do because, like I said, parents usually have normal hearing. The family typically communicates orally without sign language, and so they will want to, to have that for their children. I've had a few cases where you know the family's culture is culturally deaf, and their main form of communication is American Sign Language, so that's what they choose for their child, and, and they, hearing aids and cochlear implants are secondary. So it's really up to the parents. The majority, I think, do tend to, to get hearing aids or, and or cochlear implants while they learn a little sign language, which can be very good long term if the child gets older and takes a swimming class and can't wear the hearing aids, or it, it's bedtime and the hearing aids come out, parents can still sign to their children and that communication can continue, so. And what's the difference between American Sign Language and Sign Language from another country? They're very different. <laughs> okay. So there's, um, you know, there's French Sign Language, Spanish Sign Language, German, and they're not at all the same, believe it or not. Um, well, French is probably very similar because Gallaudet came over from France and um, that's our, American Sign Language was derived from the French, it has French syntax, so the sentence structure of American Sign Language is very similar to French um, syntax. So it's oh, not, you can't go down, down to Brazil and use American Sign Language with somebody there that speaks Brazilian Sign Language. It's <laughs> totally different. So. Although some it. gestures are universally understood. Smiles, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> laughter, smiles, yeah. I love you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Well, the, the, you know, when folks come to our, our activities and programs, people that come with a cane or with a walker, it's easy to understand mm -hmm. where they might need some assistance. But mm -hmm. someone with a hearing loss, there's no way uh, to know. That. Yeah, right. And uh, there probably are things that we could be doing better, I would guess, uh, mm -hmm. to accommodate that sort of thing and make them, make them part of the Part of the conversation, if you will. You know, I don't know what they might be, but we should think about that. I think for our programs. Yeah. yeah. What we've done so far is when we know somebody is particularly hard of hearing, we try to sit them with somebody that will help them hear, and explain to them, oh, this is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, sort of be their ears. Buddy system. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that would work. Yeah. When you put something in context, it goes a long way, probably. Oh, yeah. I imagine. Yeah, and I think too, it's probably good to, um, I try to get out and, and do hearing screenings. One of my colleagues at my practice is in the, at the Westward COA right now doing hearing screenings. So we offer that as like a service, a free thing that we do. Um, it's like a pass or fail, just a quick test. And, um, and then that gives people an idea of a baseline. Like, where am I today? Did I pass the screening? Everything's good today. Maybe next year it might not be that case, so. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about that we've 
Mm. Well, all I can say is um, it's very common to be ambivalent when you start to acknowledge hearing loss for yourself. Um, I think it's two things, acknowledgement and acceptance. And it, there are several studies that confirm that people wait about seven to 10 years on average once they become aware of hearing loss. That acceptance it comes so much later. And I've had so many people in my 20 years of doing this tell me that they regret that they didn't do it sooner. Once they realize that hearing aids nowadays sound so much better than they used to, they're so much smaller than they used to be. Um, people are realizing what they had missed out. All those weddings and events and grandchildren, it, you don't want to miss out. So I, I don't know how we can resolve that ambivalence, but if you are aware of it, try to think about you know, what you're currently doing, is it working out for you? Is it helping? If not, maybe seek to come in sooner than later. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you for coming. Thank you for coming. Sure. I, I um, noticed something uh, tangentially on a um, project that, that we've been working on for senior tax breaks at the state level. Mm -hmm. And there was, a, there was this particular tax break that we were trying to, to get passed. Yes. And what they did is, as they t commonly do in the legislative process, is kind of like attach things to each other mm -hmm. yeah. that may be unrelated. And one of the things that they had attached to this was a bigger bill that included a uh, an exemption if you're if you're uh, deaf, mm -hmm. like, because there is an exemption, a state exemption if you're blind, you know, a thousand dollars off or whatever. Yes. And uh, I don't know. I'm not sure where it went. But well, there's the hearing aid tax credit. Um, that might be what you're talking about, where if you purchase hearing aids, you can claim that as a... This was something in addition to that. This okay. was clearly in a, in a, oh. in a, a pure exemption. Yeah. Like, you know, you reach age 65, you're eligible for this exemption. You, you're blind, you, you're eligible for that. This is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on top of what you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I thought that was interesting because it, someone somewhere is advocating for that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, well, thank you very much. And uh, Angela, you are probably jumping at the bit to talk about <laughs> what's coming up. Well, I'm just going to go really quickly through some of the events that we have coming. But before we get started, I wanted to um, tell the audience we'd like to say thank you because I was the captain of the um, Carlisle Fights Alzheimer's walk um, for Carlisle. And we walked yesterday in Andover. Uh, there were nine of us, and because of some very, very generous donations, my goal was to be one of the top 10 teams out of the 295 teams, and we made it last night. Wow. So thank you to all the people that donated so generously. Well, I hasten to add that donations made between now and the end of the year count as well. So Absolutely, because we'll probably so. fall backward to 11 and 12th and 13th oh, no, point because no, no. the other teams will be collecting too. Yeah. So we will accept donations through the end of the year. Um, people can call the Council on Aging to find out how to donate, and there's also a can at Ferns, which we will leave through the end of October. Or if they write a check and mail it to? The, um, the Alzheimer's Association, and there's forms, so you can make sure it goes to our team. Huh. Okay. Where do they get the forms? Uh, they're in our office, or you can get them online at the Alzheimer's Association. Just go to the team, Carlisle Fights Alzheimer's. Okay, so with no further ado, we have coffees coming uh, in November on the 19th. We have our Chelmsford Crossing lunch, which is going to be baked ham, and that's going to be on November 1st, and we have the Seviad Light Opera coming and performing for us. Our COA lunch, um, we are excited. We have the, the band from the Carlisle Public School coming and doing ensembles as always. So we'll have a Thanksgiving dinner. And there's also a Thanksgiving dinner at the Carlisle, um, Conquer Carlisle High School. And that it's is on put Saturday, on, right? it's on a Saturday, the November um, 17th. And the first 13 people can get a ride in the van. Otherwise, people can drive over to the high school. And um, doors open at 1130 and the food is open uh, start serving at noon, and we do our Neshoba Tech Lunch. We go to the high school, and last month we had 31 people go to the high school. Their food is phenomenal. 
So in um, November, it's on the 7th, and you get to choose between barbecued ribs or shrimp and linguine. So, and well, it, those are great three course meals, and I believe they're subsidized slightly. So, the because of the friends, right? our friends um, subsidize it. So, it's five dollars, and we pay ten. So, we're very lucky that the friends allows us to so the do diner that. Pays five, yes, yeah. plus a tip for the kids. Yeah. And we have men's breakfast on November 8th, and um. Anybody who would like to join us for men's breakfast, um, preferably men, um, is welcome. And it's 8 o'clock till about 9, 9.15. One of your close friends uh, seems cooks for that breakfast. Yeah, my poor husband, because we've <laughs> lost our chef. So he's been doing it for a couple of years. And he's a really good sport and has become a quite he a makes good, a great frittata. Yeah, okay. yeah he's he's that. getting. We're trying a new recipe this week at home, um, so he's doing that. We're doing senior moments on November 26, which will have a blood pressure clinic, and we are going back to lunch at the farm uh, at the prison on the end of November on the 28th, and we'll be doing Chelsea Crossing early in December. And with that, I'm going to let David tell you a little bit about some of the other things that are coming. Thanks, Angela. We've got a couple um, trips coming up. Um, as many people know, Joanne Willens has been our longtime trip coordinator for a lot of things, and she has done something called Joanne's Restaurant Reviews. Uh, there's one coming up on Monday, November 5th, to the Aviva, Cucina, and Westford. And uh, a second one coming up on December 10th to Stelios in Bill Ricca. So we, we rotate between the towns. Joanne's mm -hmm. very good at picking these out. Um, we did just find out some, some news that, you know, one day we knew would come, but, but a little bit bittersweet that it's happening, and that's that Joanne is actually going to be moving uh, next month. And so we're going to try to maintain these, these day trips for lunch. But uh, hopefully, um, you know, we'll have another volunteer step forward to help coordinate. Or maybe it'll be a divide and conquer type of thing where we get a few people right. and we rotate them around. I think that's maybe more likely the scenario. But what we do try to do, and it doesn't compensate the person completely for what they're doing because it's a time-consuming calling and, and having people call you and registering people. But we, we, we'll, we will pay for the coordinator's lunch. So uh, up to, I think, $15, and we might even increase that um, to uh, because everything seems to be getting more expensive these days. But, um, you know, we, we really appreciate our volunteers, and uh, we have Lillian De Benedictus who does the same thing with trips to see plays locally. Um, and speaking of one, uh, there's a, a Wonderful Life, the, not the movie, but the show, which is going to be played at the, or um, put on by the Greater Boston Theater Company, and that's December 6th, and we, we're going to be going to that, too, with Lillian. So for the restaurant reviews, um, please call the Council on Aging to register. Uh, the Council on Aging number is 978-371-2825. 2895. 2895, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm still in my own mode uh, for some reason. 978-371-2895. And um, so we have those two, one in November and one in December. And we also have the trip to, um, to It's a Wonderful Life, the play. Um, should I cover the exercises? Sure. OK. Um, we, as many people know, we have some exercise classes here in Carlisle, just like the Westford COA, the Concord COA, um, and we tend to rotate where they're held. Some of them are held right here in this room um, in the town hall, and some of them are held at the, at the local churches. And um, so on, on Mondays, we have a tap dancing class, and that is held at, at FRS. We take advantage of their wood floor. Um, on Tuesdays, we have a Zumba class and a Tai Chi class. The Zumba class is in the morning, the Tai Chi class is in the afternoon, and they're both held at, at uh, St. Irene. St. Irene. Thank you. And um, on Wednesdays, we have a yoga class and a line dancing class. The yoga class is held, actually held at Benfield, which is one of our senior, senior housings mm -hmm. in Carlisle, and a uh, relatively new building built within the last, what, Carrie, four or five years? 2014. Yeah, yeah. 2014. Um, very interesting structure. If you ever want to see something 
it, it, it was built with the um, part of the structure that looks like a, um, like a farmhouse granary mm. with a spiral staircase that goes up from floor to floor. Um, they wanted to keep it within the, the well, you know, aesthetics, aesthetic, of the thank town. You, Angela, aesthetics of the town. Having trouble with my um, coming up my words these days. I maybe mean, you uh, should today. have your hearing. It, it, maybe I should. I, my significant other definitely thinks I have, <laughs> but she doesn't. But she actually just doesn't think that it's real hearing loss. She thinks it's selective. Oh, it could yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but Dr. Ford could tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll go over to Westford if we. But we we've had audiologists here in the past. And we will get Dr. Ford. And we'll to get come Dr. In. Ford to come. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's something that we we definitely um, we appreciate. Yeah. Um, Thursdays we have a fitness and cardio boost class. Those are held in the morning right here at, at Town Hall. And on Fridays we have a very interesting class called SAMA Senior Approach to Maintaining Agility, um, which uh, a professor, uh, a teacher, um, or what we call a sensei from Boston comes, and that's been running for a number of years. You take it. Yep, and really I love like it. it. And um, um, all of these classes can be tried on a new on a free basis. Um, so if you come and want to try a class and you're not really happy with it or aren't sure about it, you don't you know that that's fine. Or um, if you, um, they tend to be offered on a on a quarterly basis. You know, twelve classes at a time or ten classes at a time, depending which class. And if you know you're going to be away and are going to be missing classes, that's okay. We'll prorate we'll prorate the fees. So um, you know, there's it's really no harm no foul with these classes. Um, and people that participate in them really enjoy them. We have very good instructors um, that we want to maintain. And um, so feel free to call the, the Council on Aging, 978-371-2895, and, um, and register w for the for, for the winter classes these days? Winter. Winter classes, winter. okay, starting right. in January. Um, we also have podiatry clinics coming up. Um, um, the next one is November 5th and 6th, and that is also at Benfield Farms. Uh, we have haircuts to go, which is um, we actually have hairdressers that come here and cut hair right here at wow. this table, <laughs> multi-purpose table. We're moved upstairs. Oh, we're moving upstairs, <laughs> yeah, because Town Hall is getting a lot of use, as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, we've got an outside walking group on Thursdays in November at 9.30 a.m. Is this the last month for that? No, well, it depends on the weather. Okay. If, if, if it doesn't snow, they'll continue. Got it. And then um, we're going to have an inside walking class, too, which is generally just during the winter time. Right. Yeah. Well, it's available whenever the school is open because they walk in the inside gym. Uh, it's just most people tend to only want to do it when it's really bad out. Right. And, and also, speaking on the health side, we have blood pressure clinics at mostly all of our food Lunches. events. Lunches. Right. Lunches that you've been mentioning. And is there something that you wanted to mention about the new the nursing program? I do. I, that was next on my list. Um, <laughs> we had a David and Linda Fantasia from the Board of Health and George um, Mansfield from the Planning Committee um, all wrote a grant through Chinar at Leahy and got funding for a number of things. And one of the funding sources was for a nurse, a community nurse. And she has started, and she's doing two blood pressure clinics for us a month. Trisha. Yes, Trisha McGeehan. And she was here for the flu clinic on Friday. And she also um, is going to start something once a month where you can ask a nurse. So she'll be upstairs in the Nichols conference room once a month. Come in and ask any kind of questions you want. Uh, so if you are having some health issues, you just are curious what might be good for you, what might help with something, then come in and just talk to her. No appointments necessary to show up, um, and the first one will be on November 19th from 11 to 12. So we're very excited about that, and um, we're looking at she's going to do some training as well. We also have our social hour, um, which is actually today for October, but November 19th at Benfield, which is turns out to be more like two hours where people can just come and chat and meet new people and just sort of get to know um, what's going on and make some new friends. And we have knitters that knit. We have two, 
two separate knitting groups. One knits twice a month on Fridays, and the other one I participate in is um, called KISS, and we meet once a month at one of the um, group's members' house, and we knit for Cathedral and the Common. Mm -hmm. So actually, t this Thursday, we're tagging everything we've knitted all year long. It's going to go into Cathedral and the Common, and uh, they will be given out as Christmas gifts. So we're making ha hats and scarves, and I'm frantic to finish one last scarf. Uh, we have Replanting Lives on November 13th, which is a support group for people with mental illness and for families that have members with mental illness. And that's at the library at 1030. Again, no registration required. And one of our big holiday events is um, the wreath making for the seniors, which is December 3rd at St. Irene's. And that is donated by the um, Garden Club and put on by the Council on Aging and supported by the Friends. And also, we will be getting refreshments this year from the um, National Charity League. So that's exciting. So if you want to make a wreath and take it home for yourself, you just have to call us and register. And we have our community book club, which will be meeting on November 5th. And our meditation group meets every Monday at 1 o'clock at Benfield Farm. They even meet on holidays. And if you've never meditated, call us because they'll hold a special session to get you into what's the process so they can just they meditate as a group. So they still have room. Uh, we're still looking for enough people to run a Charlie Clark card event where if you're 65 or older and you don't have a Charlie card, you can get one that will allow you to use the MBTA for half price. Now, people, if we do that, people can come from other towns. Yes. Right. Yep. Wow. We don't care where they come. We just need at least 15 people that can make it that day. Otherwise, the MBTA won't let me run the event. So we are also looking for people for our navigating the circle of life. We have a wonderful person, Paul Kempis, who's going to help people um, see how certain people have had horrible setbacks and yet they've succeeded. And he's going to come and talk about what you can do when things face you that maybe aren't so great but how you can survive them and succeed. We have an elder law and state planning session with Eric Picard from Brown and Brown on December 4th. And then we're also looking for more people to do Are You OK? Are You OK? is a call-in system. So let's say you live alone and you would like somebody to check on you. We have an automated system that the police has. You give them a time that you'd like to be called. The system will automatically call you. If you are home, you answer the phone, you press a button, and everything's fine, and it does it's the same thing the next day. If you don't answer the phone, then they call three times. If you still don't answer the phone, they send the, the police will try getting you. If you still don't answer, then the police will come go visit you. And we've found that we've been able to save some people's lives. And um, it drives me nuts when people say, I'm not old enough. I don't need this. Well, if you live alone, you can fall and you can not be conscious enough or able to make it to the phone. And we had one person last year that spent four days on the floor. And that's really not necessary. So it's a free service. You can register for whatever time of day works for you. Some people do it early in the day. Um, one of our seniors does it at midnight because he said, I know I'm up, so <laughs> I'm always home by midnight. So we hope people take advantage of that. David, anything else on your end? Um, I was thinking about um, the medical, durable medical equipment program. Um, like several or many councils on aging, um, we get donations of wheelchairs, of walkers, of crutches um, when, when people have used them for themselves or members of their families and they're usually they're very lightly used and then they, they come they're donated 
and um, we've had this program for, for, for quite a long time. We've been able, to, we've been lucky, we've been able to store the equipment over at, in a shed at the DPW, and we have a wonderful volunteer, Clyde Kessel, who coordinates things for us, and he'll, if somebody calls in and says, uh, you know, I need a, a transport chair um, or crutches for a month or for however long, he'll go and pick it up and then and bring it to them or, or meet them there. Um, and they can really keep the equipment for however long they, they, they need. Um, and sometimes um, we've been fortunate enough to have funding uh, from one of our grants to usually the friends from, in this case, um, to buy new durable medical equipment be, just to fit in whatever mit work gaps we have. Um, and so anyway, that, that, we, that program is going to continue, um, and it, it is age unrelated. You can be any age to break a foot. Uh, um, and we're going to be moving soon. Right. And um, To Highland. To Highland. Uh, that'll be kind of a, an exciting thing for the to town. To the basement of Highland. Right. Highland is, a, is, is an unused school that has been refurbished to a certain extent, and they're, you know, um, so this will be good because there will be a use for part of the building. Okay. Yeah. Apparently the DPW wants their, their spot back. Yeah. Yep. So it's a Boy Scout pro Ego project that's taking this on. Uh, Doug Stevenson's son, Douglas, is doing this for us. So we're very excited about um, getting this new opportunity, and we're hoping that it will work well in terms of getting the equipment in and out because at the DPW we often hit ice in the winter. So we'll hopefully not have that happen anymore. So when Clyde's not around, any of us might be doing it as well. Doug's had 18 volunteers over there painting walls. So, I mean, they're uh, really moving fast to make that uh, and shape it up. So, yep. It's a wonderful it's project. Yeah. Well, I think we're uh, at about uh, our time. Uh, if... Uh, I haven't been watching. I've been so interested in what's going on. Um, but uh, I thank you, for, thank you for tuning in again this month, and thank you all for participating, Megan. And, thank you for uh, having me. Jennifer. Yeah, thank and you. Jessica. Thank you. And as always, uh, David and, and Angela. So uh, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next month. And happy Halloween. Uh, <laughs>